Hola, buenos dias. Good morning. Mi nombre es Darcy Williams. I'm Darcy, and this is my beautiful grandson. He turns five months old today. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno, California. To everyone, we say welcome. You are welcome no matter your race, culture, or of origin or spiritual or religious background. You are welcome no matter, matter your age, gender, or sexual orientation, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, non-binary. You are welcome here. You are welcome no matter your differing abilities or amount of income. You are welcome son, sin papeles y con papeles, with documentation or without documentation. No human being is illegal at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno. Todos son bienvenidos aquí. In that spirit, let's join our voices in reminding each other who we are as a church community and why we gather each week. La misión de la Iglesia Unitaria Universalista de Fresno es amar inclusivamente Crecer espiritualmente, severe con gratitud y trabajar por la justicia. The mission of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno is to love inclusively, grow spiritually, serve gratefully, and work for justice. As Tim shared a few minutes ago, today's service is called What America Means to Me, a pre-election service of hope and affirmation. If you haven't already voted, please do so tomorrow or Tuesday. Just as a, importantly, make sure your friends and relatives are voting too. Ask them what their plan is and hold them accountable for that plan. Each vote, vote matters. We need to vote as if our lives depend on it, and they do. Vote, vota. Your vote is your voice. I now lovingly pass you to Reverend Tim. Well, I am going to gently pass you to Penn, who will be lighting the chalice this morning. And as I do so, let the sound of the tingsha carry you to that place of peace and love that is within us, among us, and beyond us. Hi, I'm Penn. Welcome to my home. I'm so excited to be with you this morning and to help begin our service. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist religion. One way to understand our flaming chalice is to think about the change in temperature we experience this week. These autumn mornings got really chilly and almost cold. Some of us turned on our heater to warm up, or we wrapped ourselves in a soft sweater. The flame represents the warmth of, of love, a, warm, a warmth that dances in our heart, a love that we can share with each other and the world. Love is patient, kind, compassionate, respectful, truthful, and points towards justice for all. This flame of love is held in the bowl of the chalice. The chalice looks like two cupped hands holding something precious. It reminds us to hold each other tenderly and also to reach out and offer love to others to help make the world a better place. The bull of the chalice also reminds us that we are held tenderly by something greater than the uncertainty of this moment. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe there is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all. We rest in love. I hope you will join me in lighting a chalice or a candle of your own this morning. Let's join our voices in our song of praise when the Spirit says do. Lauren will cue us when the lyrics changes for each verse we can join in the clapping with any rhythm we like. Let's have some fun 
and move and sing when the Spirit says do. You gotta do when the Spirit says do. You gotta do when the Spirit says do. When the Spirit says do, you gotta do, oh Lord, you gotta do when the Spirit says do. Gotta sing, you gotta sing when the Spirit says sing. You gotta sing when the Spirit says sing. When the Spirit says sing, you gotta sing, oh Lord, you gotta sing when the Spirit says sing. Gotta dance, you gotta dance when the Spirit says dance. You gotta dance when the Spirit says dance. When the Spirit says dance, you gotta dance, oh Lord. You gotta dance when the Spirit says dance. Gotta laugh, you gotta laugh when the Spirit says laugh. You gotta laugh when the Spirit says laugh. When the Spirit says laugh, you gotta laugh, oh Lord. You gotta laugh when the Spirit says laugh. You gotta march, you gotta march when the Spirit says march. You gotta march when the Spirit says march. When the Spirit says march, you gotta march, oh Lord. You gotta march when the Spirit says march. You gotta vote, gotta vote when the Spirit says vote. You gotta vote when the Spirit says vote. When the Spirit says vote, you gotta vote, oh Lord. You gotta vote when the Spirit says vote. Gotta do, you gotta do what the Spirit says do. You gotta do when the Spirit says do. When the Spirit says do, you gotta do, oh Lord. You gotta do what the Spirit says do. Oh, hey, everybody. It's Tim and Grayson. And I'm excited because I'm going to be with you for the time for all ages today. Danny said, oh, go ahead and do it. So I am. Today, I have a question for you. I'm wondering what makes you feel at home? What makes your house feel like a home. Now, for Grayson, he would answer that question, I think, by saying, when I get treats, I know that I'm loved, and that makes me feel at home. He'd also probably say his stuffed animals that he likes <laughs> to play with also make him feel at home. I'm wondering what makes you feel at home? What makes you feel like you belong? What makes you feel like you are loved? When I was really little, I had a teddy bear, Smokey the Bear. This is, this is him when I was really, really little. Um, and Smokey the Bear made me feel at home. I could hug him. I could, I could tell him things that I wouldn't tell anybody else, maybe. And when I looked at him, I felt safe. Uh, when I got a little bit older, something that made me feel at home was then Kermit, Kermit the Frog. Um, and I just always liked Kermit. So I, I could talk to Kermit. I could, uh, we could sing and dance. And I also had an animal stuffed animal, if animal from the Muppet shows, and we would do shows together. And that made me feel that I was at home. Another thing that made me feel at home was from my grandma. She made for me this beautiful quilt by hand, and it was on my bed. And every night when I went to sleep, I had wrapped myself up in this quilt, and it felt like I was wrapping myself up in grandma's love. So what is it that helps you feel at home? Do you have a stuffed animal that you like to hug? If so, could you show me? Could you hold up that stuffed animal? Or if it's not in the room, could you run and get it so that I could see it? I've been thinking a lot about what makes me feel at home right now. Um, Grayson makes me feel at home because we're kind of a little family together. Um, another thing that makes me feel at home is 
the owl. See the owl there? I love birds and owls, and I have lots of owls all over my house, and that makes me feel at home. Um, also, my special animals from Mexico. Uh, this was a present for my sister. The way I decorate my house, the things I put around, help me feel at home. We all have our individual homes, but we all share a home. And that home is America. And I'm wondering what helps you feel at home here in America? What makes, lets you know that this is your home? And for some of us, it feels like home all the time. For others of us, because of the way other people might treat us, it doesn't always feel like home. Sometimes because of the color of our skin. Sometimes because we came from another country where we lived before we came here. Sometimes because of our religion, the things we believe. It causes other people to treat us in a way that doesn't make America feel like home. And that's part of our job as Unitarian Universalists, to find out what would help someone feel at home in America. And then we try to make America be that way, make this country be that way. And so America is home. And we're called by our faith. We like to say we work for justice. And that means we work to make America feel like a place where everyone feels loved. Everyone feels at home. So I'm going to hold my teddy bear as two friends of mine, Lynn Jackson and Mike Poulter, sing to us a special song about working to make America feel like a home for everyone. Bye. How beautiful How spacious sky our amber waves of grain Our purple mountains as they rise Above the fruitful plain America, America Life's gracious gifts above Indigenous and immigrant, our daughters and our sons. Oh, may we never rest content till all are truly one. America. Life grant that we may be the sisterhood and brotherhood from sea to shining sea. The blood shed through the year. America. America.
America, America, life grants that we may be a nation blessed with none oppressed, true land of liberty. How Nonviolence, all people paid justly. America, America, life grant that we may be a country. Together we breathe into that promise and that unfulfilled possibility that has always been the complexity and contradiction of America. And so let's, let's take a breath in together, breathing in peace. And we hold it for just a moment and we breathe out love. Together breathing in peace. We hold the moment. Breathe out love into this universe. One more time together, joined by our breath, we breathe in peace. We hold just a moment and we breathe out love. As we continue breathing together in this sacred space, this sanctuary that we create each week with our intention to be connected and together. We create with our breath and we create with the beauty of our beating hearts. Into this space we breathe into two questions as we first allow our breath to carry us back over the last week, carry us back over the gift of the last seven days of our living. Where in the last week did you see glimpses of hope? What is one word of blessing that you'd like to offer for the week ahead? I'd like to offer two words of blessing, but also two words of action. Vote, vota. If you haven't voted yet, please, please do so. And if you have voted, could you make sure that all of your friends and family will have done so or will do so in the next two days? Um, voting, I believe, is a sacred act. It's a, it's a spiritual act to vote to protect democracy. And even as we breathe into the action of voting, we breathe together into our collective grief, our anguish that another black man has been shot dead by police, Walter Wallace Jr. Um, wrestling with a mental health episode, the family called for an ambulance and the police arrived and that got response to see a black person as expendable, as uh, a threat that you have to respond to with deadly force rather than de-escalating, rather than taking the time to see what was actually happening. And another 
person, black person is, is dead at the hand of law enforcement. So if you would like to affirm that black lives matter, please type BLM in the comment box. B-L-M. And as we do so, we together move into our time of sharing. We share our joys, our sorrows, our concerns, and our gratitudes. If you have a personal joy, concern, sorrow, gratitude that you'd like to share this morning with uh, one another, just type that into the comment box. If you're speaking about someone else, please don't use their last names because we want to respect their privacy here on Facebook. As we share, we also lift up the names of our beloveds, those who need our prayers, our good wishes, our energy, our light, and our love. For all that has been shared, for all that we hold in the silence and sacredness of our own hearts, and for all those who on this day have no one to remember them, no one to speak their name with gentleness or love. We light our candle of community by our remembering. May we and they be blessed. As is our custom, we light a second candle this morning, the candle to recognize the over nine million Americans who have uh, been uh, come down with COVID-19, uh, who have tested positive for the virus, um, for the over 228,000 Americans who have lost their lives to this pandemic that's been so mismanaged, and for the 1.18 million citizens of the world who also have died in this pandemic. In the light of our flames, we join our voices, a call to meditation, spirit of life, Fuente de Amor. sound of an ancient meditation bowl from Tibet invites us to journey to that place of stillness and knowing within each of us.
Our words for meditation, reflection, and prayer come from the uh, extraordinary vision and heart of Maya Angelou. Uh, it's adapted from a, a short poem of hers. So let us join together in the spirit of mindfulness or prayer. Let us pray. Spirit of life, fuente de amor, mystery within this universe, love in which we all rest. May we seek patience and passion in equal amounts. Patience alone will not build the temple. Passion alone will destroy its walls. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. This morning we have a special musical meditation. It's written by our longtime church member and musician, Chris Toth. He's an extraordinary, gifted guitar player, as you have heard and will hear, um, but he's also a gifted and uh, passionate composer. This piece we're about to hear is called Flores para April, and Chris wrote it for church member April Barajas, who passed into the Mysteries of Death in August. Chris said, I did not know April as well as I would have liked. She was always a bright presence and with an energy that I greatly admired. Seeing her at church was like seeing a single red flower blooming in a field of green. And so this is Chris's composition. Uh, playing violin with him is Patrick Contreras, who is a, uh, a childhood friend of April's. Uh, they went to school together, and uh, Patrick said when he recorded his portion of this, uh, this gorgeous piece, um, he envisioned a young girl walking to school, perhaps like the young April who he knew back in those days. Flores para April. Thank you. 
Today's service is entitled, What America Means to Me, a pre-election service of hope and affirmation. What America means to me. The answer will be as unique as the individual answering that question. We'd all answer it in a different way. I've been thinking of something that Jill Lepore wrote in her brilliant little book, This America. She wrote, the United States began not as a nation, but as a confederation of 13 states and before that, a collection of colonies. The land had for tens of thousands of years been inhabited by people originally from Asia. It had then been seized, conquered, and settled by people from Europe who brought with them people from Africa held in bondage. The 13 colonies they established had little in common, so little that in 1775, John Adams, who was a Unitarian, by the way, remarked that they differed almost as much as several distinct nations. Long after the revolution, most Americans perceived of the United States not as a nation, but true to its name as a confederation of states. This even manifested itself grammatically. For decades, the country's name was a plural noun. The United States are not the United States is. What then made this bundle of states a nation? Not the Constitution, drafted in 1787, which was so fragile that it's aptly been called a roof without walls. That roof without walls had a dungeon in its cellar. Its polity was unequal. For purposes of representation, it excluded indigenous peoples living in their own nations and counted enslaved people, people of African descent held as chattel as three-fifths of the rate by which it counted an invented category of white people. Women were excluded, as were those so-called white people who did not own property. What does America mean to you? Today, three Americans will answer that question. I've invited two friends of the congregation, Zukaina Hussein from the Council on American Islamic Relations, uh, also Reverend Ana Lopez from New Thought Community, and then longtime church member and sage, Sam Zutler. They will each answer the question, what does America mean to me? But first, let's sing together. How beautiful are spacious skies. How beautiful our spacious skies, our amber waves of grain, our purple mountains as they rise above the fruited plain. America, America, thy gracious gifts abound. Peace. 
Good morning, my name is Sukane Alsane and I'm the Outreach Director at Care Central California. Thank you for the opportunity to share my reflections today on what America means to me. So America means to me opportunity for some and disparities for others. I was born in Karachi, Pakistan in 1984, and at that time and still today, America was seen by people in other countries as a land of opportunity, a place to seek better education and jobs for your family. So my family was very fortunate to immigrate in 1988 through family sponsorship visas. We lived with my uncle in New York for a year before we moved to Chicago. And what my family and many immigrant families didn't realize was that we only had this opportunity due to the fact that the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 actually followed on the progress of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. My family and I and countless others have only received the opportunity to immigrate and pursue a different life here because of the struggles, the sweat, tears, blood, and sacrifice of the Black community and the heroes of the Civil Rights Movement. Once we were here, as South Asians, we were classified as brown. And I know that my family was afforded more privileges and opportunities, especially because of the Asian model minority myth. However, as new immigrants, we face so many of the same struggles that families face today. When I was young, my parents both worked two jobs. My dad had a union job on the side while he worked as an engineer in order to get those benefits and health care. He worked nights for most of my childhood, and my mom was a full-time preschool teacher who also worked evenings, weekends, and holidays as a babysitter, oftentimes for her own students from her class. So I remember spending holidays like New Year's Eve with my sister and dad alone because my mom was always working. And I know my parents worked very hard. They had to adjust to a new life deal with language barriers, figure out public transportation, and face so many of the same struggles that immigrants today face. Even though I realize and recognize that we, I am forever grateful for the blessings from God and the perseverance from my parents, I know that we had access to educational and professional opportunities that others did not receive. This includes everything from home loans to being able to find a house in a good neighborhood with good schools to having an education that included extracurricular activities and internships and a pathway to college that has really helped propel me forward in my career today. These privileges and opportunities are not available to all communities, and that may be due to numerous reasons, but a lot of it is due to systemic disparities from racism, due to economic status, due to lack of investment in educational uh, programs for students and young people, and so much more. So in addition to the disparity in opportunity, what America has meant to me is a lack of inclusion. Although I recognize the privileges I've received as being a non-Black person of color, I know that I am still very othered and marginalized as a Muslim woman, particularly one who is visibly Muslim in hijab or my head covering. I know what it feels like to have to convince others and prove my Americanness. I've spent many years in high school and college having to share that I too enjoy pizza and I also go to the movies and I do speak English so well, even though I'm of Pakistani or immigrant heritage. I attended a grad school in Missouri where I was invited to be a part of a photo shoot for their uh, promotional magazine, even though the school was not very diverse at all and it refused to meet my needs as a Muslim student and did not have respect for my values as a Muslim. So needless to say, I of course did not participate in the photo shoot and I refused to give a false pretense of inclusion to future students. On a broader level, this country practices its lack of inclusion by systematically excluding people, even from decision making, uh, from those who are in positions of leadership. So, for instance, women like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib hold some of the highest elected positions in this country, but they are still told to go back to where they came from, or they are villainized or oppressed because of their faith, instead of celebrated for their work their values and their impact on their community. They are being systemically excluded. I also see exclusion of 
people like the MENA community, the Middle Eastern North African community, from something as simple as the census, which I'm sure you've all filled out just recently. But because there is no ethnic identifier for the Middle Eastern North African community, there is a lack of data on their presence, on their identity. They are not able to prove that their community exists in, in the numbers that actually are here in order to receive services, to be recognized, to have their needs met. And on that very important topic of civic engagement and voting, I still see exclusion from the polls. I'm sure you are all very familiar of the history of voter disenfranchisement in this country. While we're still seeing voter suppression through voter ID laws, long wait lines, a lack of enough voting sites in low-income communities, communities of color, and a lack of adequate information meeting the language needs of immigrant communities. So from my perspective as a Muslim, I know that I am driven by my faith to do good in this country, in this world, in my community, not by a need to please others or prove my Americanness. This country is my home, but that does not mean I take pride in its history and continued legacy of white supremacy, racism, oppression, Islamophobia, and disparities of opportunity and lack of inclusion. So if you are a citizen, and you are able to vote, please remember to vote by November 3rd and vote for a better America, one that is inclusive and one that does provide opportunity for all. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sam Zutler, and I am proud to be an American. I'm proud of the story of my family's struggle against religious intolerance so often faced by refugees around the world. Both my mother and father were born in Ukraine. My pop left his family's birthplace to escape the pogroms against the Jews and to avoid being drafted for service into the Russian army. He was escaping what he knew would be a very bleak future. At age 17, he walked across Europe, earning his way as a shoe repairer. In England, he boarded the ship to New York City and landed at Ellis Island. My mother also came to America through Ellis Island with her parents and three children. As did many other Jewish refugees, they settled on the east side of New York City. During World War I, my father joined the American Army and became a cook. This service to his new country afforded him the opportunity to become a U.S. citizen. He was so proud of that. Later, with the assistance of a shotgun, a marriage broker, my father met and married my mother. In 1923, I was born in New York's Hell's Kitchen, a very tough neighborhood at 10th Avenue and 52nd Street. 11 years later, my brother Aaron was born, and by this time we had moved to Brooklyn, where my father was living his American dream. He had worked and saved enough money to buy his own shoe repair shop. There was a small two-bedroom apartment in the back where we all lived. Our neighbors were Greek, Italian, Chinese, and of course, other Jewish families. We were living the American melting pot. I had just begun college when World War II broke out. And like thousands of other young men, boys really, I enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Corps, and after graduating from a cadet training school and receiving my appointment as a second lieutenant, I returned home to visit my mom and dad. Dad took me around the neighborhood to greet his friends and to show me off in my new dress uniform. I will always remember how proud he was of me. After serving three years in the military and having married my first wife, Geneva, during that time, we moved to Berkeley, California. Thanks to the vision of President Franklin Roosevelt, 
the wonderful GI Bill, I was able to finish my college education and graduate from US, uh, from UC Berkeley with a degree in industrial engineering. Grateful for the opportunities and assistance given to veterans, I decided to stay in the Corps Reserve for a total of 20 years and retired as a lieutenant colonel. My BS in engineering led me to a 35-year career in management at Dow Chemical Company. My brother became a very successful marketing and merchandising consultant. We owe some of our good fortune to the lessons our immigrant father taught us. He understood all the opportunities available in America, and he knew that with hard work and determination, he had a way forward to take care of himself and his family, and he installed in us the hard work ethic he believed. If I get a job, my job, any job, work hard. Always do the best you can. Be grateful that you live in America and be proud. And I am proud, proud of my heritage, proud of this story. I am proud to be an American. Hi, Reverend Ana Maria Lopez here. I am privileged and deeply honored to share some of my family's story. My grandmother was born here in the Valley in 1926. Her parents came here from Mexico to work. So America offered us as a family uh, prosperity and, and riches uh, that we would get paid and women would get paid. The truth of that though, was we were farm workers and we didn't know that we were not getting paid very much. We struggled to have food. Uh, I remember standing in line with my grandmother and waiting for handouts of food for beans, rice, powdered milk, and cheese. My uh, aunts and uncles, we all worked in the fields. And I remember this one time where I went to work with my aunt and my uncle, and we were picking grapes. And the owner came out and he started yelling at my uncle. It was for some reason on how we were laying grapes. And he came out and he was yelling at my uncle, saying he was only going to pay him 50 cents, or I think it might have even been less than that per row when we were hoping to get 75 to 80 cents per row. At that moment, I saw my uncle grovel just to at least uh, get paid something for the row. And I was able to witness that my uncle was afraid that we weren't going to get paid any money for all the work that we had done. And yet, this owner still had work that was completed. And so I was able to really take in and recognize that even though we could work really, really hard here in America, which we thought was prosperous, we still wouldn't get paid what we were due or for the work that we worked hard for. Growing up, I was able to see my mom and dad. They worked two jobs each and went to school. And um, my mom became a, became a nurse and my father uh, became machine maintenance. And um, I saw how hard they worked. And yet I wanted to know, how could we work smarter instead of harder? My father told me I had to work hard, and this I did. I know that uh, 
life doesn't come to you with handouts. And sometimes the it's stacked against you. But we get up. We have our family to help us. And for that, I am grateful to be here with my family. It is not always perfect to walk around in a skin that's brown or to walk around that's female. But we do what we need to do and we get up and we are stronger as family. We're stronger together. So thank you for listening to my story. Have a blessed day. A poem perfect for these pre-election days of waiting and wondering. It comes from the soul of the poet laureate of the United States, Joy Harjo, a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. She writes, Stand tall, no matter your height, no matter how dark your skin, your Spirit is all colors within. You are made of the finest woven light from the iridescent love that formed your mothers, fathers, grandparents, all the way back to the spiral road. There is no end to this love. It formed your bodies, feeds your bright spirits. And no matter what happens in this time of breaking, no matter dictators, the heartless and liars, no matter you were born of those who kept ceremonial embers burning in their hands all through the miles of relentless exile those who sang the path through massacre all the way to sunrise you will make it through What is America to me? A name, a map, the flag I see, a certain word, democracy. What is America to me? The house I live in. Plot of earth, black tie, the grocer and the butcher, or the gente that I meet, las niñas in the playground, the faces that I see, all races and religions, that's America to me. The place I work in, the worker by my side, the little town, the city, where my people lived and died, the howdy and the handshake, the dream of feeling free, and the right to speak my mind out. That's America to me. The things I see about me, the big things and the small, the little corner newsstand, and the house a mile tall, the wedding and the graveyard, the laughter and the tears, 
And the dream that we still dream of For more than two hundred years The town I live in La calle, la casa, the room The pavement of la ciudad All the garden all in bloom The mosque La escuela, la tienda The million lights I see But especially, especially the people That's America Hi everyone, it's Lisa Lindsay, and I serve gratefully as president of your board of trustees. So we just had our October trustees meeting on Wednesday night. We're meeting on Zoom, and I need you to know we are making it work. <laughs> Please know we have a knowledgeable, caring, and committed board. I'm so grateful for each one of them. And we are working closely with Reverend Tim to help steer us through these unprecedented times. I know, I said unprecedented, but really, you guys, these are unprecedented times. Together, we will learn to lead in love. For Reverend Tim and staff to continue their committed leadership of the congregation, we need to ask you to share as you are able. For those of you who are not members of the church, your financial offering in gratitude for these Sunday services is so critical to our being able to remain a progressive religious voice in the Central Valley. And for those of you who are pledging members, are making a, an additional contribution above and beyond our pledge amount, has quite honestly kept our church afloat during these times. Our Staff and programs could not continue without these special gifts. Muchos gracias. There are, of course, several ways that you can make your offering today. There's Cash App, there's PayPal, there's credit card, text, or the old fashioned pen to paper. Stick that check in the mail. Yes, we will trust our postal service. A slide will appear with all the information you need in just a moment. But first, in the spirit of grateful generosity, join with me in saying our words of offering. If not us, then who? If not open hearts, then what? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? If not generously, then how? If not us, then who? Thank you for saying yes. Bye. Hola, soy Danny. Howdy friends, Danny here, and I'm ready with a reveal of Reverend Tim's Sunday Socks. Now, this week we encouraged you to go vote in the polls for democracy rather than voting for socks. So there wasn't a competition, but the socks are still meaningful. In fact, this week's Reverend Tim's pre-election socks are entitled Mighty Woman with a Torch, whose flame imprisoned lightning and her name is Mother of Exiles.
Now, I do have a few reminders for everyone. First and foremost, I wanna tell everybody how excited I am that we are going to be able to have in-person religious exploration for our children starting November 7th. We do need you to register and those links will be in the comments below and are available on your order of service. But we are so excited to be able to offer this. We will do it socially distanced. We will do it mask. We will do it safe. We're limiting to 10 per section to make sure that we can make sure that we are protecting our kids the absolute best way we can. But we're going to be able to be together. We're going to be able to learn together. We're going to be able to grow as Unitarian Universalists together. Also, the new photos directory team is so excited that they're adding photos to the membership directory. So you can find out about the membership directory information and how to update it if you go to the updates tab on the web page. On November 4th, we will be having a Zoom post-election gathering, no matter what the results are, to come together and be with one another in community. On Thursday at 2, we'll have an in-person one. Pre-registration will be required and we will do social distancing and masks. And with that, I'm going to pass you gently to Patty. Hello, I'm Patty Bennett, and I'm the coordinator of congregational life here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno. I'm happy to be talking with you today. If you have recently found our church community, you may have questions about what Unitarian Universalists believe. Today, I invite you to join Reverend Tim for an introduction to the seven principles of our faith tradition. This engaging hour-long class will begin at about 11.45, soon after the end of the service. I'll post the Zoom link in the Facebook comments. This class is designed for newcomers, but it is equally valuable to anyone who wants a refresher on our principles. These are the core values that we affirm and promote and that we aspire to follow in our daily lives. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Now we'll return to Penn for our chalice extinguishing. Hi, it's Penn again. Welcome back to my home. I'm so glad that you're here this morning and that we shared this time of being together. Coming together here on Sunday at our Zoom coffee hour after the service with Reverend Tim and Danny's workshops at our new Live on Campus monthly spirit school explorations. All of this is a choice we make, a choice to stay connected to each other, a choice to stay connected to this church. As we prepare to end our ser service and enter into the afternoon, please join us in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts. Extinguimos esta llama, pero no la luz de la verdad el calor de comunidad o el fuego de nuestro compromiso. Estos los llevaremos en el corazón. I hope to see you all again soon. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Remember to vote. Thank you, Penn. Thanks for being part of the service this morning. It really means a lot. Well, dear ones, we are at the end of another service. We have closing words, our sung benediction. Oh, oh, and then you have to stay for Lynn Jackson and Mike Palter's postlude. It's a song you'll be familiar with, but you're going to love their rendition of it. Um, and so let's take our hands, place them over our beating hearts. America. America, life grant that we may be a country blessed with none oppressed, true land of liberty. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. May we have faith. Save.
Shalom and Assalamu Alaikum. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me the golden valley And I said, this land was made for you and me I roamed and rambled and followed my footsteps Through the sparkling sands of her diamond deserts And all around me a voice was asking Is this land made for you and me? to stop me and on a sign it said no trespassing mm -hmm. but on the back side it didn't say nothing this, this land was, was made for you and me in the squares of the city the shadow of the steeple by the relief office I'd seen my people as they stood there hungry I found myself asking Is this land made for you and me? Nobody living can ever stop us As we go walking that freedom highway Nobody living can ever make us turn back This land was made for you and me this land was made for you and me This land was made for you and me